So shout out Keys of Life. Uh, anyway, shout out the comments when they pop up. Um, so basically, you're going through the drawings. You make comic books and hustle them. You create a whole bunch of imagination worlds. You bang out scores in your head. All this kind of stuff that's running through it. Let's say as you're going through that phase of life and you start into high school, um, what are some of your first, like when do you start to really get into music more for yourself? And what are some of your first favorites? Also a good question. Um, well, I made a radio station switch at a crucial moment, like probably when I was like 13 or so. I started listening to like the alternative station. 1077 the end and that was like when my musical passion first really got ignited this has got to be extremely stereotypical in many respects i mean i'm from like a small town outside of seattle but like i got into nirvana that was a huge like sea change in my whole perspective on music and reality and my passions and i gradually gravitated toward what at the time i would have called punk because it was also and it's still called punk, but it was like a lot of pop punk as well because there was, it was in Nirvana, but then I got it in. Green Day was my favorite band for some time. Weezer after that. It was around the time where you're like, your identity is forming at high school and stuff like that. And so your musical choices are inseparable from sort of your cultural niche choices in terms of your self-presentation. Mm. And that's what I gravitated to. Also, I just loved punk music because I felt like I could start to make it, you know, for the same reasons that generations of people have loved that because I like picked up the acoustic guitar that like, lived you know someplace you know in our like attic or something and started just banging on it and i was like this is cool i'm like doing it already <laughs> i've already arrived and i was fascinated by that ethic and that's that's that was definitely the beginning of it yeah and everything comes from that seed i think so it's like that 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 ethos is like very much at the root of my creativity so you got into green day picked up the guitar and we're just able to bust out some shit that sounded good enough for you so you started rocking with it yeah good enough to like I remember writing down little songs on little note cards. I didn't really know chords. I just was sort of like futzing around. But then I, f I had a friend who was taking guitar lessons, and then I was sort of siphoning off his guitar lessons. Like he, he, I would be like, "What'd you learn at your last one?" And then I would just like copy him and like learn it that way. You know. <laughs> Yo, that's an interesting way to work around the system. If we think about how we could apply that into a modern day setting squad up at like six people each you cop a master class and then everybody yeah, yeah. can share the knowledge that's what i'm trying to do with my degree just just wrap it to the people you know <laughs> yeah i really respect it a lot of my platform is i learned this shit let's talk about this shit <clears throat> totally because it i don't know i find there's a lot of gatekeeping and knowledge and it bothers me and nobody talks about it like they talk about the one percent of wealth but they don't talk about the one percent of intellect and it's weird because it's the exact same mm. phenomenon but like, you know, I don't know if you ever talked to a person and I'm not really, I don't really, I didn't like academia. There was this like pretentiousness to it where I was unable to like fit into that world. And I felt like people mm -hmm. learned a lot of jargon specifically to gate the content in order to make sure that people who didn't learn that jargon were unable to understand it. And when you try to approach people with like a simplification effort, like, yo, I could take your complicated and make it simple. There was this attitude of like, nah, I earned this shit that I encountered a mm -hmm. lot and I didn't like that. So I'm like the opposite yeah. with it. No, I think a lot of that is a cover because, like, I've been thinking about this a lot. I, um, because I used to be more participatory in academia in the traditional sense, like, I would be going to conferences and things like that and presenting papers. And I don't know how many academic conferences you've been to, but Very little. there's a lot of people just like reading a paper and then people sitting listening to it. And there's not actually a mutual understanding going on because in order to like sit down and like have people have an audience and read your ideas to them and have them be well understood, you have to not just have good ideas. You got to be a good writer and a good presenter. You essentially have to be a good performer. So nice. the only truly capable academics are expressive artists in their own right in terms of the full machinery of what is required of an academic. I love and they're starting to realize this, I think, because I think academia is starting to break a little bit and show some of its cracks and then ironically like they're you know like i've been working with uh, my friend baba brinkman who started this thing called event rap and he does a lot of like academically inflected hip-hop and he's been getting us gigs me and some other folks gigs like going to academic conferences and then like doing like a wrap-up of like what all the papers are about because oh the conference needs it to have some life in it you know what i mean like and academics are going to start to realize this that the really fundamentally older modes of expressive production 
which are poetic in origin in any civilization, need to be reintegrated into intellectual discourse, even at the highest levels, in order to survive. And if we eschew that performativity, then we're not only making it so fewer people can understand us in our yeah our one percent intellect niche or whatever, um, but we're also not going to be able to 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 maintain the institutions themselves. You know, and when I say we, I don't even really include myself necessarily as an academic, but just the institutions. No, I hear you. So I'm just going to summarize that because when you drop the shoe, I'm like I'm going to try to summarize that after. Effectively, um, if motherfuckers be boring, ain't nobody listening. <laughs> <laughs> you really summarize that quite beautifully. You know, <laughs> um, I think because yo, I have to. I gotta be, not necessarily about anyone in particular, but I have gone to corporate versions of this shit. Yeah. So I do the corporate grind, and there are a lot of conferences and a lot of the same kind of. Oper I wonder if that opportunity exists. I'm gonna fucking look into that. That was the best hustle anybody's ever told me that I could actually do. Summarize shit and make it rap. Fuck me, I'm in. Um, but like, they're like that. They're boring. So I actually got really far in work not necessarily because i was great at work but yo you could i could break down a pdf editor with flair i could break down the most boring shit like a rapper so like people like my demos and my presentations and my webinar skills yo webinars it's just rapping but not totally and so but that's if you're like good at it but like for me i write it like a show now i gotta practice it like a set and like you know i treat it like like a rapper would treat a show so like it comes off like that but yo a lot of people are just not they're, they're just kind of boring with it they just talk and you're like totally. man you gotta really focus on what they're saying and the second that happens you're not listening because you're trying so hard to like care and you know so i hear what you're saying on every real front man i've lived through a lot of that I like that you found a way to yeah to apply that to yeah the corporate sphere and different dimensions because yeah it's it's all the same thing it's all transmission of information and it's a it's a in the economy of such transmission the more successful transmissions will be the ones that have some mental hooks that get into people which is the oldest thing you know what I mean like we we think of like if we're if we're even limiting the discussion to academia like we think of school as this sort of um, one directional neutral transmission of certain facts or data or lore from an authority figure to an audience and in some ways that that reflects much of its history but its earliest history even if we limit it to let's say what we call western civilization so i'm not talking about every single culture right now and i know that even that concept now is fraught but you know among the greeks like school didn't exist in ancient greece per se what you had were personalities who gathered followers unto themselves because they were super compelling for their ideas yes but also their self-presentation eh, they're like empedocles is that this is the philosopher that's credited with the invention in the western you know stream of content anyway of of the notion of the four elements the guy credited with the invention of the notion of the four elements at least in in western civilization not talking about all all, all cultures the earth air fire and water idea he was, you know, we remember him as a pre-Socratic philosopher, one of the philosophers operating prior to Socrates. But he wasn't just that. He was like a pop star. He wore these like fancy multicolor robes. He referred himself as a god. He had a whole coterie of like adorers and he expressed all of his ideas in verse. He was not just like a rapper type, but a super flamboyant, like crazy pop rapper, like pop star extraordinaire. Love it. He was he was over the top with it, you know what I mean? And what the what gets transmitted, you know, about his legacy is not that typically now in school, but just like, yeah, four elements idea. There you go, boom. Yo, everybody does make this shit boring. So I copped this book on Icelandic poetry from like mm. the year thousands to like twelve hundred. It's basically like whatever. But you realize these Icelandic poet types <clears throat> would have to show up in like the King of Norway or whatever. And man's would be like, bro. You best write 88 bars about how I'm the shit on the spot. And if you do it, you get a sword. And if you don't do it, you die. <laughs> and then they would quote the bars. And not all of them because it was boring. But this is like, and meanwhile, you realize all of this is just bars. The whole book is oral yeah, history, is. which is man spit in poetry. So when you look at a lot of this older shit and you like realize there's a lot of repetition and a lot of things like that, it's because they're basically dropping like hundreds and hundreds of bars of story to document history 
And that just to me like blew my fucking mind on how nobody broke it down like that to me until I read this Icelandic book. No, that's that's such a good point. Yeah, no, that that is that's precisely the point that I'm making, and it's and it's a super important point. It's actually what one of my next projects uh, is. I want to do a song, an article about this, about like the bardic tradition, and it shows up in so many different instantiations. You know that like bard is a Celtic word for like that. You know that uh, that extraction. Rhapsode is the is the word in Greek. Grio is the same concept fundamentally in the West African you know tradition, which is already so intimately connected with hip hops. Uh, self-reflection you know in terms of looking at like what are we doing here uh, but it's just it's not it's you can find it instantiated in pretty much any civilization of which we have evidence with important differences obviously but the differences are superficial compared to the essential feature of a poetic transmission of information in oral poetic modes you know that's what it is mm-hmm.